Hi, my name is Nathan Thabarge. I'm the library director here at Rolfing Library at Trinity International University. And today uh, we welcome Stephen Bryan, Dr. Stephen Bryan with us. Uh, he is a professor of New Testament here at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Completed his MDiv and his THM here before completing his doctorate at Cambridge. Uh, and before becoming a faculty member here in 2016, uh, Dr. Bryan and his family served as missionaries in Ethiopia for many years, where he was involved with and oversaw theological education, leadership development, and compassion ministries. His main area of scholarly expertise includes the Gospel of John, Jesus' relationship to the law, and as we'll talk about today, cultural identity. When not teaching and writing, Dr. Bryan enjoys exploring nature preserves with his family, gardening, and trout fishing. So welcome, Dr. Bryan. Thanks very much. Good yeah. to be here. Thank you. Um, so to start off in the preface uh, to this book that we're going to talk about today, uh, you say that the, it was rooted in a seminar on ethnicity that you taught in Ethiopia. Can you talk a little bit about what it is about the course that sparked some of the ideas that led to this book? Well, I think it was, it was partly in, uh, in that course that, that I realized that, uh, that there was a, a huge difference between the way that I saw uh, my Ethiopian students and colleagues and the way they saw each other. Mm -hmm. um, when I saw them, I saw Ethiopians, uh, but, but when they when they engaged with each other, when they looked at each other, they saw ethnic difference. Uh, and often that, that, that ethnic difference was invisible to me. It was very visible and it was the dynamic that, that affected so much of what, of what happened. So we had this, this seminar on ethnicity in part to try to cultivate some uh, theological thinking around ethnicity uh, in yeah, yeah, because it was a topic that many people um, really just thought about from, you know, culturally determined terms and mm -hmm. uh, and not from a biblical perspective. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and and in, in relation to that, what are some of the similarities and differences that you see between an, an understanding of cultural identity and the Ethiopian context and what that looks like here in the context of the United States? Yeah, you know, I think the U.S. is uh, ethnicity, of course, um, is uh, is a reality here, uh, but we are a very racialized society, and so race is a, a much more salient form of uh, of difference um, of collective identity or cultural identity than than ethnicity. Ethnicity is there, um, but uh, but I think it's the uh, difference along lines of race for historical reasons. Um, but I think just the, the, an awareness that not all societies are racialized hmm. uh, is, is something that if you travel to a place like Ethiopia, you realize maybe for the first time and, and, and you realize, oh, there is a different way of thinking about what it means to be a group or a people or a collective. Hmm. Um, that sense of belonging to a, a particular group, I think just, it just sorts out in different, in, in different ways. Mm -hmm. And it helps underscore, I think, as well, the important fact that uh, so much of the way that we experience our sense of belonging, whether that's to a nation or to a people or, or to an ethnic group uh, or to a, ra you know, a particular racial group, um, is culturally constructed. It's, mm -hmm. And it's constructed along lines of difference. We, uh, we recognize that we, you know, what they call it, you know, some people call it othering. We we recognize it in encountering difference. When we see uh, encounter someone who's not like us, then we see it. If we're only around people who are like us, we might not even recognize it. And many of us perhaps grew up in, in cultural contexts where we didn't see difference, we didn't meet difference uh, very often. And, and so as a result, we didn't, we didn't, we weren't even really aware of it. It's when we encounter a difference, that's when we become aware of our own cultural uh, identity. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, in the book, you define cultural identity as the sense that I belong to a people and make sense of the world in relation to the constellation of norms and values, beliefs and practices associated with that people. Can you unpack that definition for a little bit, a little bit for us and explain kind of the key elements that you see in defining what cultural identity is? 
That was pretty good, wasn't that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do we how do we think about what culture is? It's a really difficult term to to define, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of debate in the literature about what it is, and some even say it's not a thing. Um, but we all have a kind of intuitive sense of, of what it is. So that was that was a way of trying to put words around what we commonly experience. That, that is, we do operate according to kind of unwritten rules, uh, kind of rules of the road, things that, you know, you know norms of, of conducting ourselves, the way that we interact with one another, the way that we think about things like, you know, it's the choices that, are offered up to us, like on a day-to-day -day basis. So, I didn't grow up in a context where I mean, this is this is a trivial example, but uh, where hummus was an option, like a food option available to me. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it's not to say that in societies that you know where that is an option, that everybody's going to you know regularly choose that option. Uh, there may be people uh, where hummus is a kind of a national dish where they just don't like hummus. You know, that's fine, but it's an option there. And so you might think about uh, a culture as kind of s setting out our options from which we make ch uh, the choices. And we don't even perceive that there might be other choices out there uh, until we, again, meet that, meet that difference and see, oh, they're choosing from a different menu. Uh, they're a different set of kind of rules of the road, unwritten rules and options that are available for, you know, how you're going to, you know, choose your way through life um, that, that are available to them that aren't available to me and vice versa. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. In, uh, in organizing your discussion of cultural identity, you really kind of follow the biblical storyline for most of the, of the book, you know, beginning in Genesis and going through to Revelation. What do you think was the importance of structuring your book in that way? Um, partly it's practical. I'm, you know, I do biblical theology, and so you know, that, that's kind of what biblical theology is, so it's, it, it was a, a practical reason. But um, another, another reason, I think, was that there's a lot of material out there on ethnicity, race, even nationality. Um, that's written from a political perspective, from a, a sociological perspective, or an anthropological perspective. Not that much written from a biblical theological perspective. So even material that's written from a Christian point of view isn't necessarily attempting to, to think about peoplehood from a, you know, across the storyline of Scripture. So that was really what I was, was trying to do. Um, I think the, the significance of that is um, is the fact that you you don't know what something is really until you know what it's for, and that's true of peoplehood. What is peoplehood for? Um, does it have a purpose in the purposes of God? Is it is it for something, um, or is it this kind of uh, something that kind of comes into play after the fall that will ultimately be kind of done away with. Uh, it's in which case it's good for nothing hmm. because it doesn't. It's not part of God's purposes. It's something that God, you know, in that in that way of thinking about it, it's something that that God is working to eradicate. Hmm. Uh, and I think a lot of people, you know, have really thought about cultural difference in that way that ultimately. It's something that we will get beyond. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about cultural difference as something that we will get beyond, we will all, you know, in, in heaven, we will all have the same culture. We will all speak the same language. We will all simply be individuals, uh, you know, before God. And then we, you know, the significance and the importance of a peoplehood kind of goes away. Mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't have it. You, um, in, in, in line with that, you, you talk about how diversity um, is one of the core themes, right, of, not, of, of God's creation. Um, and why do you think that is where the important 
beginning of our biblical understanding of cultural identity there in creation? Well, I take you know, sort of the early mandate, sometimes called the cultural mandate, uh, uh, I take that to be a kind of expression of divine intent. Um, that when God says, you know, fill the earth, he doesn't mean populate the earth. Mm-hmm. He means fill the earth with diverse cultures and peoples, mm-hmm. and not just fill the earth with people. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think kind of the proof of that comes in Revelation, where mm-hmm. you know all these different peoples are gathered before God. He's mm-hmm. he's assembled them to His throne, and they're they're all present as peoples. Uh, mm-hmm. And you have that, that you know anytime you have a reference to uh, to collective identity in Scripture, often it comes in various forms. Uh, and so these, you know, nation, tribe, tongue, you know, however you want to think about it, um, mm-hmm. these different forms of peoplehood, it's, they're all kind of represented there in, in, uh, in kind of the telos or the, you know, where the, the, the biblical storyline is, is, is going. So mm-hmm. it's there an expression of the divine intention at the beginning, and it's, it's there in what we have as the fulfillment of that intention at the end. Uh, and so if you can trace it from beginning to end, um, and it's important at the beginning, and it's important at the end, it must be important. Right. That's kind of the idea. Okay. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, in, the, in the book, you discuss uh, the emphasis of certain kind of secular ideologies on individualism, and then other ideologies on collectivism or community good. Um, how does the biblical narrative speak to both of those the value of the individual as well as the importance of community? Yeah, yeah. It's a really good question. And I, I wanted to kind of set out uh, you know, some of these kind of models for how to deal with cultural multiplicity mm-hmm. because there are very, very few societies in which you don't have cultural multiplicity. Mm-hmm. And all of these kind of political approaches to what, what might call the problem of cultural multiplicity uh, you know, societies all over the world, they're trying to figure uh, figure this out. And there are all different kinds of approaches to it. Um, in the U.S., the approach that we've taken is we're not going to think about groups. We're only going to think about the individual. And that's what is called, you know, classical liberalism. That's the basis of our Constitution uh, here in the United States is that, you know, everyone is created equal. Uh, and... And so that's kind of the, the, the foundational principle. Sure. So why do we have a history in which uh, racial difference, di- racial differentiation, why that matters? <laughs> if we're supposed to all be just thinking about individuals mm-hmm. and the only sense in which there is peoplehood is that we are a nation of individuals. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when we say, when our constitution starts off by saying we the people, it's talking about we as individuals but there are there are certain societies ethiopia is one of them and the constitution doesn't start off we the people it starts off we the peoples Mm -hmm. in other words we're going to be groups and what we are as a society is not a collection of individuals we are a society of groups Mm -hmm. Uh, and so they've they've made that explicit in their in their in their constitution um i think that uh that you find societies sort of swinging from one end of the, you know, we're, we're going to only prioritize the group. This is in collectivist societies or, you know, could be Marxist societies or other collectivist arrangements where we're, we're going to prioritize the group. Uh, and, and sometimes what that means is the group yeah. to the exclusion of any other sense of, of, of groupness. Yeah. And so if you're, for instance, in a, in a mainland Chinese context, um, it's the civilizational, you know, Chinese civilizational sense of culture. That's mm-hmm. the thing that we have to give priority to mm-hmm. over the individual and over any other s- subgroups, mm-hmm. you know, ethnic minority groups. They're going to have to kind of, you know, come into this kind of singular sense of, of culture. Um, mm. and so it, it takes a variety of forms, but all of them are political responses 
to the problem of cultural difference, to the problem of cultural multiplicity. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was good to set, a, set out the fact that all societies are, are trying to figure out a way to, to deal with this mm -hmm. uh, and as a way of putting into bold relief the fact that scripture also is interested in a foundational and fundamental way in this question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's that's helpful. Um, the term uh, privilege is a contested and kind of contentious term, especially in the context of the United States. Um, how do you understand that term in light of the New Testament and particularly um, in light of the New Testament's teaching on hospitality? Yeah, how that informs should inform our understanding. Right, right. The concept of of privilege as, as you meet it in, in contemporary literature um, as a political or so sociological concept is, is about is a property of groups. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably the thing that gets misunderstood the most. Um, it's not, you know, whether or not you as an individual experience uh, what is uh, associated with that the privilege of the group, you may not. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so if I, as a member of a dominant cultural group, I'm a member of a privileged group, I may not myself experience mm -hmm. the privilege associated with that group mm -hmm. as an individual. It's a, it's a, it's a property of groups. Mm -hmm. So that's probably the most, you know, kind of misunderstood mm -hmm. thing about groups. The way, the significance of that in scripture is that we do have, through much of the storyline of Scripture, the stark reality of Israel's privilege. Mm -hmm. They are God's privileged people. And I think that's, you know, there's no other way around it to say that this is a people that has, has been privileged kind of in the storyline of Scripture. The question is, what is the significance of that mm -hmm. in Scripture? How do we think about the importance of that and what is... And what is it for? Uh, and what does it mean? Um, and I think it relates, uh, particularly in the Gospel of Matthew, to the concept of, uh, of privilege in the sense that uh, you can think of, of privilege as something that is only for my group. What do you do with the privilege that you experience? Do you say, this is, this is, this is mine and it should be taken away and, and given to others? Or is it something that should be opened up so that others can per particip participate in it? So uh, what is this, the solution when one group has a privilege that is fitting because it's God-given and another group doesn't have it? And the answer is, I think, you, you make it available to, to all. Uh, and so I think uh, the image of a feast in Matthew is very, very important. Um, you know, chapter 8, you know, it talks about sitting down at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of God. Um, and, uh, and those who are ostensibly privileged, Jesus say, said, will be cast out, uh, but others will be welcomed in. Hmm. And so it's, it becomes the, an image of hospitality, you know, that what is Israel's privilege for? They're there to be a host to the nations. Uh, their identity is to, you know, this is the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant, that in you, all the families of the earth, all the nations of the earth will find blessing or be blessed. Um, so if that takes place specifically inside of Israel, then that, that then becomes a privilege that is properly experienced only through the sharing of that privilege. Mm -hmm. Only through the sharing of that blessing. Um, mm -hmm. And so it is a way of conceptualizing uh, the significance of difference between peoples by suggesting that a proper relationship between them, properly functioning peoplehood, is kind of the vision of the Abrahamic, of the Abrahamic covenant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I was struck by one of the chapter titles, um, or the kind of the subtitle beneath the main chapter title was the destruction and renewal of cultural identities. 
How does the gospel destruct and renew our understanding of our cultural identities? Um, probably the hardest chapter to write in the in this book mm. um, was the chapter on the conquest. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm a New Testament scholar. I just I just need to not write that chapter. <laughs> it's really, it really what needs to. Re- re- and then I realized, well, how can you write a a, a a book on like the importance and significance and value of culture, you know, of cultural identity to God mm-hmm. um, when you have the conquest in which all of these cultures are sort of being wiped out. Mm. Uh, yeah. so, it's a, it's a really difficult question. Mm. Um, it's fascinating. I think that was the, the, the subtitle to the, the, um, to the chapter on Revelation, that what, you've, what happens in the book of Revelation is some of that conquest language gets picked up in the book of Revelation Mm -hmm. to talk about what's going to happen to all nations. Mm -hmm. All nations are going to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. So that that kind of totalizing language is very unexpected because you have it the other way as well. All nations are going to be present. All peoples are going to be present. All peoples are going to be destroyed. And so it raises the question, how can both be true? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) How is it possible for every people to be destroyed and for every people you know completely destroyed completely Mm. annihilated and for every people to be redeemed Mm. um that's a really difficult question in the book of revelation uh, just as a you know as an interpretive question Mm -hmm. but i think the book of revelation affirms both Mm -hmm. Uh, every cultural identity in its present form is idolatrous Mm -hmm. and must be completely destroyed that it you know it must be it it must die and rise again as it were Mm -hmm. and that is essentially the christian story about peoples Mm -hmm. um not just you know in christ not not just us as individuals but Mm -hmm. the groups to which we belong they must they too must die and rise again because they are all idolatrous hmm. and it must be all be raised to, to, to new life. Yeah, thank you. Um, as, uh, as people read this book, what do you hope believers will take away from it in terms of what are the lessons, what are the main takeaways that you hope someone can take away from this book and then apply in their relationship in their churches, neighborhoods, yeah. schools, different contexts? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, I guess what I, I guess most of us come from societies in which, uh, in which groups are constantly, constantly pitted against one another. Mm. Uh, the idea is that they are in competition for power, competition for resources, competition for equitable treatment, questions of, of justice. Those are those are really important and in many societies really challenging, uh, really challenging questions. Um, I think what I would hope people would take away from this book is a kind of what, you know, what uh, Charles Taylor calls uh, a social imaginary. That is a new way of thinking about uh, what peoples are for. Uh, like Christians would have in, you know, kind of a, an Ab- a fulfilled Abrahamic covenantal view of what collective identity mm-hmm. is about, what it's for. It's so that when we encounter difference, we don't see we don't see threat, we don't other, we mm-hmm. see the opportunity for recip- reciprocity of blessing, mm-hmm. um, a, a blessing received from God, blessing shared with with others, mm-hmm. uh, and then blessing returned. Uh, and uh, and that becomes then a kind of uh, uh, the wealth you know what Adam Smith called the wealth of nations where where this often you know not this competition for 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 scarce resources but the abundance that we receive from the divine giver uh, and uh, for the purpose of sharing for the purpose of uh, not only receiving blessing but of of sharing blessing with uh, with others, and if that blessing takes 
the form of our cultural wealth, not just kind of material wealth, but our cultural wealth, then we see ourselves as, uh, as something, as, as a people who have received something uh, that is to be shared, a, a source of blessing to other peoples. Mm-hmm. Um, and we see other peoples the same way. That is, that they have something important and valued to God to share, you know, to share with us. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, a reframing of this, of our imagination of what, of what this, of what cultural identity is for. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Brian. Yeah. Uh, and again, the book is Cultural Identity and the Purposes of God. Thank you for joining us. Um, if you're watching this. Uh, on uh, or if you're here in person uh, really appreciate your time in coming and in watching this and thank you again dr brian yep good